dust off your Geiger counters because it's time for more nuclear physics with Doc. Click, 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 click. How's this thing gonna work? Oh, I put this over here and I'm like, beep, beep, beep. All right, cool. So you do that at home, kids. In the meantime, I wanna tell you, we left off with what's called the strong force. And I wanna tell you some properties of the strong force. See, the strong force has two properties, primarily. The properties are this. One, it acts in really, really, really short range. And I'm talking, you talking about short range? I'm talking about Fermi's. I'm talking about one femtometer or so of action, which means that it does not affect, no effect on electrons or chemistry at all. No effect on chemistry. The chemists don't need to worry about the strong nuclear force because it is such short range. Let's see, what else do we need to talk about? Oh, it's also really, really, really strong. So let's talk about the stability of a nucleus. I made you a little graph right here. And this, <clears throat> this graph is a graph of the number of neutrons versus the number of protons in an atom. And I've graphed the line n equals z because early on, these data points of stable nuclei do follow the general pattern where if you've got another proton, you're probably gonna need another neutron. So let's just look at some examples. If you look at hydrogen, you can have hydrogen where there's, um, <clears throat> there's one proton, right? And one, oh, I mean no neutrons. You can also have hydrogen where there's two well, there's one neutron and one proton because then this is A, right? And then, uh, so that's called deuterium. You can even have tritium. This is not stable though. That's the problem. Deuterium will last you for a long, 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 long time. But then you can have helium and you can have helium three or you can have helium four. It prefers to be in the helium four form though because you got two protons and you've got two neutrons. So neutrons must feel this strong force. Felt by nucleons. So it's felt by protons and neutrons. So the nice thing about neutrons is they don't add anything to the repulsion force of the nucleus, which is just from the protons, but the neutrons do contribute to the, uh, the glue that is gluing these nuclei together. So it turns out that as you get even, even heavier, bigger and bigger atoms, you need to have disproportionately more neutrons because you need to space out your protons a little bit more because the electrostatic force, of course, Kc, Q1, Q2 over R squared, depends heavily on distance. And uh, as you get these guys spaced further apart, with more neutrons, you don't add to the force, you merely diminish the force, but you've still got this strong force happening here. So here's a question for you. Why not have atoms that have enormous number of neutrons and very, very few protons? Why aren't there more stable things over here? And we'll talk about why that's the case. Turns out just a few of them are stable, and if they're not stable, then they're going to be decaying in various ways. So I'll draw some lines over here. Generally, the ones that are on this side of the graph are gonna be decaying in one way, and the ones that are on this side of the graph are gonna be decaying in another way. And these decay modes are things that we'll talk about in a little bit. But let me introduce you to a little bit of radioactivity, Becquerel discovered radioactivity. It's really a French thing. And then Madame Curie and Pierre Curie were all about radioactivity. And this is shortly after 1900 happened, 1905. There was a ton of experimentation that was happening on radioactivity. So one of the cool things about radioactivity is that if you put a radioactive thing in a box right here, you find that there are rays coming out of it. And they called them alpha, beta, and gamma rays. And I wanna to talk to you about these three different types of rays. I'm setting them in a box, and here's my radioactive stuff. Radioactive stuff. I don't even care what it is. Uranium, plutonium, americium, whatever you wanna put in there. But we put this in a box, and then outside of it, I'm gonna make a magnetic field. And I'm gonna have that magnetic field pointing in all the time. Here's my magnetic field B pointing in all the time. And they did this and learned that there are generally three paths that the radioactive stuff will form. Some of the radioactive stuff just went straight out of the box. 
pew, right? Some of the radioactive stuff, generally, some of the radioactive stuff decided to go like this. Let me see if I can get this right. Yeah, oh yeah, it went like this. It went just slightly curving that direction. And finally, there was a type of radioactive stuff that came out of here and went pew, and went around a little circle here, right? Wow, that's really curvy compared to those guys that are just a little bit curvy. Interesting. All right, let's look at uh, what they named these guys. They called this one alpha, and they called this one beta, and they called this one gamma. Turns out that those are the first three letters of the Greek alphabet. So they just wanted to label these three types of radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma rays. So you got alpha and beta, and gamma rays, and that's uh, radiation. They are radiating. They're coming out in straight lines unless there's a magnetic field on, in which case you can get them to separate and learn more about them. So I'm going to distinguish these three types of rays. The names are stupid nowadays, but they stuck because of this original sorting procedure. An alpha ray. Now it's known that an alpha ray is actually particles. An alpha ray does not penetrate very much. Paper can stop it. Wow, an alpha ray, therefore, is not particularly dangerous. As long as you're behind a sheet of paper for your defense, an alpha ray can't really hurt you. What about a beta ray? The cool thing about beta rays is they are a little bit more dangerous. You need to get um, aluminum foil to stop it. Uh-huh. Because though that's, uh, that's a little bit scarier. You wouldn't want to let beta rays hit your skin. And then what about this guy called the gamma ray? Gamma rays are a major problem. Gamma rays can go through several centimeters of solid lead. That's an enormous amount of mass, and this ray just shoots right through it. Let's see. Several centimeters of... Lead. I'm gonna have to talk over that guy, so I think I can do it. All right, several centimeters of lead, aluminum foil stops beta rays. These guys right here are helium nuclei. Helium nuclei. So we're talking about two, four, and I'm gonna have a two plus right there because it is very positively charged. Notice that if I have my velocity that direction, the magnetic field's in, then the force will be upward on it, but it's got a lot of mass, so it's not gonna turn very much. Ooh, beta rays, I'll tell you about beta rays right now. Beta rays are just electrons, and a lot of people call them beta minuses because there's another thing that's called a beta plus, and this is the opposite of electron, it's a positron, all right? So that guy will turn like that because it's negative, so I have velocity coming that direction, magnetic field into the page, and the curve that direction as this guy just starts out. Of course, it's not going to do that. It's actually going to hit the wall. It'll go thunk like that. That's a little bit silly of me to pretend that it won't be acted on until it gets out there. Then, then you've got gamma rays, and gamma rays are actually light. Cool. Let's call it a deal. I'll get back to you when I can shut off that guy. Goodbye.